Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Sunday Night Live with Pasadena Church. We are so honored to have you join us today, and I believe it's no coincidence that you're watching, believing that the Lord has brought us together for a reason, to be encouraged and strengthened so that we can do the work that he's prepared in advance for us to do. Amen. Here in Southern California, we've had extreme heat, my Lord, and now we're experiencing intense wildfires all around us that create poor air quality. In some places, it's, it looks like it's snowing because of the ashes, my Lord. But we're believing the Lord for these fires to be contained and extinguished. And I don't know what you may be threatened with. It may not be a natural disaster. It may be something spirit, physical that you're going through, emotional or even spiritual. But I want you to know today that God's got you. Trust in him. He will not fail you. Amen. So let's go now into a previously recorded worship celebration as we celebrate the goodness of the Lord, his faithfulness, honoring him because he's worthy to be praised. So, so our praise today is a reflection of our understanding of all that Christ has done for us. So we're going to sing the story and it's going to remind us this morning of why we praise him. Hallelujah. I said it's going to remind us this morning. This is a story that reminds us. It's a song that helps us remember why we praise him. You can clap if you want to. Tell your neighbor you can clap too. Come on, let's just worship the Lord today. Yeah. Whoa. This is how it goes. He came to live. Live a perfect life. He came to be.
sing it. Everybody sing. Every voice sing. Come on. Say hallelujah. Yeah. Come on, everybody.
What a powerful time of worship. I love how we were just prioritizing our faith in the Lord as we sang, Give me you, everything else can wait. In these challenging times of wildfires, coronavirus, racial injustices, virtual online classes, and a divisive election, we really have to bring our focus back to Jesus, amen? Just to get centered as we navigate these important issues. In Psalms chapter one, verses seven, reading from the NIV, it says, may the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. May we shout for joy over your victory and lift up our banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your requests. And this is the key. Now this I know. The Lord gives victory to his anointed. Just place your hand on your heart. Because he's speaking to you, he's speaking to me. Just say, victory belongs to me. Amen. He answers him from his sanctuary with the victorious power of his right hand. Now some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Come on, say it again. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. Amen. Now I know you might be saying, I'm good, Pastor Madeline. I'm not trusting in horses or chariots. But you have to remember, 
that this psalm was written by King David, who was a man of war. He was a man of battle. And the safety and the comfort in that day was found in horses and chariots when you were in battle. But David said, no, we, we're going to trust in the name of the Lord our God. Now today, we can substitute what we have been placing our comfort and our safety in. It may be your job. It may be a stable economy, your bank account. Just going to church and worshiping together as normal or hanging out with friends without having to social distance and be six feet apart. Just being able to hug your people Oh, how I miss your hugs. That's one of the things that really sustained me when I was going through the start of our grieving process when Morgan passed. I just come to church to worship and to be loved with all of your hugs and encouragement. You know, it's so easy to place our comfort in these wonderful things and miss the priority of placing our trust in the Lord our God. And because He is such a good Heavenly Father, He wants to be the one you find your safety in. And so I'm asking that whatever it is that you've been falsely placing your trust in, I'm asking that you would just lay it down. Come on, just lay it down right now and allow the Lord Jesus to be your comfort, your safety, and your strength. Come on, just take a moment right now to do that. And let's pray together. Father, we just lay down everything that we've been falsely placing our comfort and safety in. Lord, we lay it down before you. We lay down even the world as we once knew it. And Lord, we're saying, give me you. You are the source of my strength. You are the strength of my life. You are the one who sustains me. And because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you, God. Lord Jesus, we declare that victory belongs to you. And thanks be to God, you give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we declare that we're placing our trust in you and not in these other persons or things. We invite you into our homes. We invite you into our bedroom, into our kitchen, into our family room. We invite you into the room of our hearts, Lord. And we say, you are our desire. You are the desire of our hearts, Lord. So we set aside everything else that we've been placing our faith and trust in. And we open our hearts wide to you. We invite you to be our comfort, be our peace, be our strength, be the answer, be our solution. King of glory, just release your healing power and presence even now to anyone who is sick, anyone who is brokenhearted, anyone who is discouraged, Lord. Father, I just pray that your healing power and presence would surround them and minister to them right where they are, that they would be healed and lifted up, God. And Father, I'm praying that you will just come into our hearts. Father, we make our hearts the dwelling place of God and we receive new joy new strength new life because you've given you've given us life and that more abundantly and so father it's our desire to walk in that life that you've given us and to represent you to all that we're coming in contact with in Jesus name we pray amen amen God bless you Okay, to put your hands together. Hallelujah. You can even stand and sing this song right along with me, amen.
your favor, your favor over me. Sing that one more time. You got to get in there, amen. When I think, when I think of, your goodness, of your goodness, oh, 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 oh. Kindness, hallelujah, your grace is giving me life. Giving me life. When, I when I see your favor, favor over me, over I'm so grateful, I'm grateful hallelujah, and I know my Savior. part with us. Amen. Now I believe that you're for me. Hallelujah. His new mercies waiting for me every morning. Come on, everybody say it. thankful to God. Would you lift up a hand in this room and thank God who brought us from darkness to life, who brought us from death to life. And because of that fact, because we're raised to life in Christ, we have the best life now. And amen. Come on, Leslie. I've got the best life now. Hallelujah. Yeah. Living the best life now. Come on, you guys can confess that. I've got the best life now. Oh, oh, oh. Jesus. Come on, everybody say it. I got the best you. life. I'm living the blessed life. Living the best life now. Come on, say, I've got the best life. I've got the best life now. Oh, 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 oh. Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Exceedingly. Exceedingly Hallelujah. Overabundantly. Amen, amen. That's one of my favorite songs. Overflowing, overwhelming. More than I could dream, you're giving me life. Hallelujah. And if we have an opportunity, we're going to get back to that song at the end of this message. But now I want to go into our word, a word today I believe the Lord has given me for you. And the theme is eracism. This land is our land. Eracism. This land is our land. For those of you who have been following us online, you know by now, well, this pastor, are you going to ever, are you going to ever preach about something else, pastor? Amen. I am. But now the Lord has me on this subject. 
The Lord has me on this topic because of what's happening in our community and in our world. And I heard one um, theologian say it's important for us to preach with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. Well, we don't have newspapers like we used to, but we still need to be aware of the signs of the time and know that the Lord has a word for everything that's happening around us. And the way that we have seen the mistreatment of people of color in our country and how we've even seen the Christian church um, being complicit in these matters, we believe that it's an, it's an opportunity and a time for us to speak on them. So I want to dig a little deeper this morning and I pray that you'll just walk with me as we talk about this matter of beloved community. How do we build beloved community? And I ran across a quote from the King Center, um, the organization that Coretta Cott Coretta Scott King developed after the death of her husband, Dr. Martin Luther King. It's a powerful quote about beloved community. As I talk about it, it creates a wonderful framework. So I want to read the words from this from this group about his beloved community. Here it is. It says Dr. King's beloved community is a global vision in which all people can share in the wealth of the earth in the beloved community, poverty, Hunger and homelessness will not be tolerated because international standards of human decency will not allow it. My Lord, my Lord. It goes on to say racism and all forms of discrimination, bigotry and prejudice will be replaced by an all inclusive spirit of sisterhood and brotherhood. My Lord, my Lord. That's what it's all about. Amen. Us understanding that God's called us to live in community with one another. And in order to build upon the concept of establishing beloved community, we must be clear about the foundational truths related to our existence and our relationship to everything and everyone. So that's where I want to park today. I want to I want to stay on this right here for a little while because it's it's vital to 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 not only our existence, but it's it's important for us to understand these things so that we can live peaceably with all men. As the scripture says, we must establish this type of, of relationship with one another based on these foundational truths so that everyone in our lives and everyone we come in contact with will understand that we're here for one another. Amen. You see, I believe that racism exists and it is allowed to continue and flourish because of ignorance. I believe it's the ignorance of men and the refusal to know God and what his plan is, what he wants and what he expects for us. So in order for us to grow, in order for us to get to the place where we can dismantle these systems, the systemic racism and prejudices and the things that we're seeing all around our country, we've got to know what God wants. We've got to know what he expects. And you see, when people opt out of God's plan, the result is much of what we're seeing right now. But when we opt in to the plan of the Lord for our lives, we, beloved, will see the fruit of justice the fruit of righteousness begin to overtake and overthrow every manner of evil and wickedness in the earth. So we start by understanding today that this land is our land. Come on. Can you say that with me? Come on. I'm gonna count to three. Let's say it all together. One, two, three. This land is our land. For those of you of a certain age, I don't know if the school children still sing it today, but when I was growing up, there was a song that says, this land is your land, this land is my land, from California to, the, to this and that, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream water, this land was made for you and me. Well, I don't know, some people don't feel too good about that song now, considering how um, the, the, those who thought they found, they found America actually found some people here already. The indigenous people of, of America were here, the Native Americans, as we call them. So it was actually their land and much of their land was taken and stolen from them. They were killed and they were run off. And we still have some of our indigenous people groups on reservations to this day. That's a whole nother topic. But when I talk about this land being our land, I'm not just talking about the United States of America. I'm talking about this world that we live in. 
And in order for us to establish beloved community, we've got to understand our relationship with the world that we live in, the very earth that we live on, and God himself and what he wants from us and, and how we, we must live our lives in a way that honors him. So as we talk about this land being our land, we've got to focus on a few truths um, that we've got to establish. Not only last week as, as we did that, but today I want to go a little deeper. So if you're ready, come on, let's go. The first point about this land being our land, we've got to embrace and understand is that God owns everything. Oh, yeah, I know it, it sounds it sounds like it's so simple, Pastor, but you, you would be surprised at how many people don't really understand that. You see, the last time we were together, I was sharing that God's intention for humanity is community. You may remember that. God's intention for humanity is community. And through the story of creation, we realize that God is the creator of everything. I read from Genesis last week of how on day one, he created day and, and, and night. And on day two, he created all the way through day six, where he created man in his own image and likeness. Well, they did because God said, let us make man. But as we realize that God is the creator of everything, we must truly understand and embrace this truth. And when we do, I believe we can be delivered from the spirit of possessiveness. My Lord, <laughs> I know you're saying, oh, Pastor, you're making up words. And I don't, I don't know if that's a real word, but, but I think I made a, may have just made a new phrase up. The spirit of possessiveness is one of the things that keeps us from being unified. Sometimes it seems like Christians and people in general can be like those seagulls. You remember those seagulls in the movie Finding Nemo, where they would just sit there and say, mine, 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 mine. That's how we are sometimes when it comes to the world that we live in and, and our earthly possessions. But the truth is, the truth is that it's all God's. Amen. I believe Mr. Brother MC Hammer had a song called It's All Good. Well, the truth is, it's all God's. Everything that was created. Everything that we see, everything that we have belongs to God. God owns everything. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite verses comes from Psalm chapter 24, verses one and two in the living Bible. I like to read this for you because it just explains it matter of factly. Here it is. It says the earth belongs to God. Everything in all the world is his. He is the one who pushed the oceans back to let dry land appear. My Lord, I know, I know some of you may say, well, that sounds a little different from the way I learned it. I know me too. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and everyone in it. Amen. But the truth is that it all belongs to God. He is the owner of the world. He is the owner of all of humanity. We all are here because of God. Amen. I had a thought as I was thinking about this truth about everything belonging to God. I remember working in a ministry um, where um, at, at some point we were taking inventory. The ministry was taking inventory of everything on our church property. I don't know if you've ever done that with your with your job or your office or whatever, but there was a brother in charge and he made ID tags and labels for everything in the building. I mean, he put a label on every chair. We had labels on the pews. We had labels on the instruments. Every room had a label assigned to it, the lamps, the desk. I mean, everything. I thought for a minute that the brother was going to put a label on me, hallelujah, saying church property, my Lord. I'm glad he didn't. I knew he wouldn't do that because a few people really didn't want me there anyway, my Lord. <laughs> but as a matter of fact, I tell people um, that, that we really should have a tag somewhere on us or inside of us that says made by God because God made us as well. God made everything and everyone. This is foundational to establishing community. We don't belong to ourselves. We actually belong to God. And when we align with God's purposes for our lives, when we allow God to lead us and to guide us, we come into a place where we can now have um, unity and community. 
God actually says in another place, just to show you that not only did he create the earth and everything in it, the world and everyone in it, God goes on later on to say in Psalm 50, another passage that the cattle and the hills belong to him. Come on. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm chapter 50. I believe even in our groups here in Pasadena, we're reading the Psalms every day and we might be around the 50. So this is so appropriate. Here it is. David says, I have no complaint about the sac. God is speaking, actually. And he says, I have no complaint about the sacrifices you bring to my altar for you bring them regularly, the Lord says. But it isn't sacrificial bullocks and goats that I really want from you for all the animals of the field and force are mine, says the Lord. The cattle on a thousand hills and all the birds upon the mountains. If I were hungry, I would not mention it to you, the Lord says, for all the world is mine and everything in it. My Lord, my Lord. A few years ago, I think Shaquille O'Neal had a, a, a design called Twism and it stood for the world is mine. Well, Brother Shaq, I'm sorry to tell you, the world isn't yours, brother. The world is the Lord's and everything in it. Not only the world, but God created the entire universe. And all of the other universes were made by God. This is essential. See, when we understand this, then we can align with others and we can join in others in in, in the work that God's called us to do because it's all his. Got to show you this or last one. I know I'm throwing some scriptures today, but Hebrews chapter 11, verse three. This is the faith chapter. It it gives us the definition of faith. And right in the middle of verse three, here it is. It says in the NLT, by faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. That what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. My Lord, my Lord. As I read this scripture, when I consider um, the, what the impact of, of this scripture, it really reminds me that there is no such thing as man-made material. As a matter of fact, I just laugh every time I see that, that little postage man-made material. Sometimes it's on some shoes or, or maybe on a, on a handbag or something like that, but there's no such thing as man-made material because God made everything and everything that we can see was made by him. Come on, say it with me. God made everything. God made everything. Hallelujah. Now the second point, the second point is connected to the first with a very important distinction. And the distinction is this. Yes, God is the owner, the creator of it all. But when it comes to stewardship, when it comes to the management of the earth, he entrusted to us. So the second point is God has given us the land. I know you were waiting. You were waiting for the title to become relevant. Pastor, how did you think of that title? It comes in here in the second point. God made everything. He owns everything. He is the owner, but he's given us the land to be stewards, to be managers, to take care of. We must understand that that as the Lord owns everything and gives us the land, it's important for us to know that there's an expectation that comes along with that. And one of the key scriptures that I've memorized to help me remember this truth comes again from Psalms. We've been in Psalms a lot. Psalm 115, verse 16. Here it is. It says, the heaven of heavens is for God, but he put us in charge of the earth. Amen. I like the message translation that says he put us in charge of the earth because that implies stewardship. It belongs to God, but there's an expectation from God for us to take care of this world that he's given us, including each other. This shows us that God hands over the responsibility of keeping and taking care of the earth and everything related to it. He hands that over to us. And you see, that's why I'm personally saddened and sickened by these wildfires I talked about earlier, because the wildfires over 99 percent of them are usually caused by people being irresponsible. As a matter of fact, the major fire that's here in California was caused, watch this, by a family having a reveal party. 
with pyrotechnics and, and all of these things that, that got out of control. My Lord, my Lord. Now, thousands of acres are burning and people's lives and homes are being destroyed because somebody wanted to tell everybody that they're having a baby boy. And it set off um, sparks that set off a fire that's now just devastating our, our state. Lord, help us. Help us, Lord Jesus. And we want you to pray for us and with us as well. But one final perspective on this on this on this truth comes with the story of Moses. You know, um, by now, I love the story of Moses and the children of Israel. So let's look back at Moses um, here. You remember me talking about Moses um, a few weeks ago. And going back to Exodus chapter three, God starts Moses off. I'm not going to read it, but but when God calls Moses um, to go back to his people and to deliver them from Egypt, God actually starts Moses off at the finish line, Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai, as as the scripture tells us. God takes him to the finish line and he says to Moses, when you've won, I'll see you back here for a celebration. When you've done all that I've called you to do, when you've brought my people out of bondage and out of slavery, I'll meet you back here and we're going to have a celebration. We're going to worship right here on this mountain. That's in Exodus chapter three, verse 12. But I want to fast forward to to over 40 years later. They're back at it. And, and, and the people have come out of Egypt. God delivered them, but they spent 40 years in the wilderness because they disobeyed God. What should have taken a few days journey, they were there, stuck there out of disobedience to God. But finally, they get to this point and now God is going to take them into the land that he promised. You've got to you've got to read this for yourself in Deuteronomy chapter one, verse six through eight. Listen to what the scripture says about this story. Forty years later now, the Lord says, people of Israel, here it is. When we were in our camp at Mount Sinai, the Lord, our God told us, he told us, you have stayed here long enough. Leave this place and go into the land that belongs to the Amorites and their neighbors, the Canaanites. This land includes the Jordan River Valley, the hill country, the western foothills, the southern desert, the Mediterranean Sea coast the Lebanon mountains and all the territory as far as the Euphrates river. I give you this land. Remember what did we say? The second point is God's given us this land. He said, I give you this land just as I promised your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now you must go and take the land. Ah, did you catch it? Did you catch that? I know I read it kind of fast, but God said, God said, go to the land that belongs to someone else. I'm giving it to you. Amen. That, that may just be a word for somebody today watching today. The land may be occupied, but God said, I'm evicting them out because I promised it to you. Hallelujah. We used to sing a song that says what God has for me, it is for me. Don't worry. Don't fret. If God's spoken into existence, if God has spoken it to you, you must trust that he's going to bring it to pass. Even if some other folks got to go. So this takes me to my final point. Number one, we said that God owns everything. And the second point was God gives us this land to be stewards over. God gives us the land. So the third point, when it comes to moving towards beloved community, dismantling racism and living victoriously in all circumstances, we get to this, this, this final thought. Number three, we must now take the land. Come on, just say take the land. Take the land. I've been ministering, as you know, you may have been following us, ministering in, the, in a local park here in our community where a young man was shot by the Pasadena Police Department. And I've been there every day from 5 p.m. to 11 p.m., just ministering to the community, praying every hour on the hour, handing out water, amen, and, and just snacks for anyone who stops by. 
but I'm learning how important it is to be in the midst of, of the community. Um, and by so doing, it represents taking this land for God, that which the enemy is trying to destroy people's lives and our community. As we enter in that space, we are taking the land for the Lord. Hallelujah. You see, not only are we, my friends, not only are we responsible for the physical upkeep and stewardship of the earth, as we said earlier, we must also understand the spiritual component to this particular revelation. There is a divine expectation for us to follow the Lord, lead others to him and live in harmony with one another. So then taking the land simply means to seize every opportunity that we have to utilize all that God has given us to live for him and make the world a better place. God's plan will carry us. God's plan will carry on with or without us. So it, it makes sense to align with his heart to align with his plan so that we can, in fact, take the land so that we can not only um, survive in this world that God has made and created for us, but there's a, some more work that God has for us to do. And that work is winning souls. That work is possessing the land and taking back those places and, and, and people that the enemy has stolen. That's our mandate as we talk about beloved community. So the concept of beloved community is just not an ethnocentric idea. I understand that sometimes it's important for us to, to heighten the awareness for all people mattering, but when we really break it down, I'm, I'm, we're talking about all people, all of God's people. This is important, I believe, as we look at the story of Joshua, who now takes over um, for Moses. Moses brings them, brings them to the edge of the promised land and the Lord says, OK, now it's time to go over. But right at that point, Moses dies and the Lord places Joshua in command. And now it's time after 40 years, after a whole generation of those who started off from Egypt died in the wilderness, it's this new generation that Joshua is now taking in to the promised land to take the land. So let's read it in Joshua chapter one, verses two through five. I love it in the NLT. Here it is. The Lord says, Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people the Israelites across the Jordan river into the land that I'm giving them. I promise you, the Lord says what I promised Moses, wherever you set your foot, you will be on land that I have given you from the Negev wilderness in the South to the Lebanon mountains in the North from the Euphrates river in the East to the Mediterranean sea in the West, including all the land of the Hittites. No one, the Lord says, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. This powerful word um, um, uh, empowers Joshua to lead God's people, giving them the confidence and the courage to go and to take that land that was possessed by other, other people groups. But God knew that those people had to go. This was the land that he had promised to the descendants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is, this, this passage is personal to me because many years ago, actually September the 15th in a few days, um, I will be celebrating over 35 years of becoming a, a Christian. When I was praying about um, direction after I received Christ, September the 15th, 1985, I asked Jesus to come into my heart. And, and I began praying about what God wanted me to do in my life and, and the calling that I was feeling that he had on my life. And the Lord took me to this passage that I just read to you here in Joshua. And he spoke to my heart and he said to me in my heart that if I followed him, everyone that I reached out to everywhere I go, God said, I'm going to give them to you because really the hearts of men represents the land that God wants us to take. 
Jesus talks about going and Jesus talks about um, the parable of the sower and how the word of the, of the Lord is the seed and it falls on good ground. Well, that ground represents the hearts of men. And I continue to trust God to this day for souls for the kingdom. As a matter of fact, will you agree with me? Come on, souls for the kingdom. That's what it's all about, souls for the kingdom. That's why I've spent two weeks in the park with people, with friends, with brothers. I call them brothers and sisters now, family, who simply need to know that Christ loves them, that he is helping and healing our community. The point is this. Beloved, we must go. We must take and possess the land that God has given us. I believe he's given Pasadena for Christ. And wherever you may be watching this from, you need to declare it as well. God has given us this city for the kingdom. We cannot expect the land to come to us. We cannot expect any longer for um, the land to come to us. This is where I believe the current disconnect often happens when it comes to our church, to our churches. We have built ministries that cater to us. And many times, if you think about it, when it comes to our church services, our programming, our edifices, where we worship, what we do, most of it is, is about us. And we'll tell people, come to us. We'll fix you if you get here, if you make it over here. But this is also why some are so preoccupied, I believe, with getting their buildings back and having their religious liberties compromised. That's not how it's supposed to work. As a matter of fact, Jesus didn't say go into the building. Jesus said go into all the world. I want to show it to you in Matthew chapter 28. This um, is, is my final scripture. Hallelujah. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus came and here it is. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, here it is. Go and make disciples of all nations, all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this. I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. My Lord, if Jesus expected us just to go to a building, to a location, why would he say the nations? Why would he say I'm with you to the end of the age? It's because he, there is an expectation for us to go and to make disciples, go into our communities, go into the places where the gospel has not been preached, go to the people who are hurting the most, go to those who are in distress, go to those who are in debt, those to, go to those who are discontented and tell them that God loves them, that Jesus died for them. He said, you do this, Jesus says, I'm, that last, I'm with you. I just put it this way since I've been hanging out in the hood. Jesus says, I'm rolling with you. He rolls with us, hallelujah, when we go and take the land. That final point is we must take the land. This is what he's calling us to do. Take this land. So say it with me one more time. This land is our land. Come on, one more time. This land is our land. I want you to say it all week long. I want you to declare it everywhere you walk. When you go into the grocery store, hallelujah, this land is our land. If you've got to go to work into your job, this land is our land. When you see someone who doesn't know the Lord and they're suffering and hurting, this land is our land. And then you go help them. You go serve them because this is what the Lord requires of all of us who name his name. You probably can tell that I get excited about these things. So I'm just I need to tone down because I want us to pray together before I close. I want to pray for you, my friend. I want to pray for those of you who are watching who may say, well, pastor, um, I hear what you're saying. But but sometimes it's difficult to to understand this when it seems like it's it's a dog eat dog world or it's a rat race and, and everybody's trying to get their own. Well, I understand that world and I understand how that happens, but we don't have to subscribe to that. 
We can be steadfast, unmovable, as the scripture says, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And we're not threatened by other people's success because we know ultimately God owns everything. We don't have to get a, another car because somebody else got a car and, and we're trying to keep up with the Joneses, my Lord, my Lord. You get close enough to the Joneses thinking that the grass is greener on the other side. When you look over there, you realize that ain't even real grass. God has a better plan for us. We must understand that he owns everything. We must understand that once we understand that he owns everything, we also can embrace the fact that he's given us the earth to be stewards and managers over. Even the, the riches that may come through us into our hands. God said to Abraham, I'm blessing you to be a blessing, not to spend it on yourself, not to acquire um, all of these things. Have you ever seen a U-Haul behind a hearse? going to the cemetery? No, it's because you can't take any of these things with you. God expects us to take care of the land now. And then he says, finally, take the land. There's a responsibility for us to evangelize, to disciple, to make disciples, to make a difference, to serve as Jesus came to serve, to love even those who don't love us back. This is what it's going to take for us to build beloved community. Come on, let's prepare to pray. And as we pray, if you're here today, you say, well, pastor, the truth is I haven't asked Jesus into my heart. I'm not a, a follower of Christ. I'm not a Christian. I've heard that phrase, but I don't, I don't even know what it means totally. Well, it simply means to say yes to the Lordship of Christ saying, Jesus, I understand that I can't control my own life. I can't handle that, but I'm giving all that I am to you. As we pray, I want to give you, I want to invite you to ask Jesus to come into your heart as well. Will you pray with me right where you are? You may want to kneel. You may want to close your eyes, but let's, let's look to the Lord. Father, thank you for this day and this opportunity to share this word with my friends on, online. And Father, I pray that even as we know your word is powerful and effective, effective, wherever it goes, Father, that it would produce a harvest of righteousness in the name of Jesus. We thank you, God, for helping us to understand that everything, the world and everything in it, including our, ourselves, all belongs to you. But yet, Lord, as the owner, you give it back to us and you said, you said, take care of it. Take care of this earth. Take care of one another. Take care of each other. You've given us the land. And then finally, Lord, you say, take care take the land. There's aspects as we talk about our spiritual pursuits, there's aspects of us going forward and making a difference in the lives of others, reaching people for Christ. And, and even where we live and where we reside, making a difference right there in our communities so that even the injustices that we see and that we're experiencing all around our nation will not be able to continue on our watch where we are because we are your people. And as we occupy that land, darkness has to go. Hallelujah. And I pray finally, Lord, for that person who may be watching and saying, I want, I, I, I thank you for the invitation. I want to receive this gift of salvation that Jesus offers me. If that's you, my friend, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord, I ask you to come into my life, into my heart. Jesus, I love you. And I acknowledge that you died for my sins. I give you now all that I am. And I thank you for forgiving me, for healing me, for setting me free. And from this day forward, I declare that I'm yours, Lord. I'm your child. I'm saved. I'm delivered and I'm free. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. If you prayed that prayer with me, I'd like you to do something. I'd like you to text the, word, I, the words, I believe. Text, I believe, to 626-602-1165.
That way we can stay connected with you. We can send you some material to help you grow in your new relationship with Christ. If you can't do that, you can go online, if that's easier for you, to our website, www.pasadenachurch.com. And on that homepage, there's a tab that says decision card. If you click that tab, you can go right on that page and fill out the information. I made, I've, I've received Christ as my Lord and Savior, or I made a, a renewing my relationship with Christ. You can even request prayer on that page by typing in your prayer request and it'll come to us and our intercessors and our church will be standing in agreement in prayer with you on a daily basis. So please take advantage of that. And if you are a first time member, this is your first time, or you, you kind of regularly um, pick up and come on to the service, we like to stay connected with you. Would you please take a moment just to text the word hello? Text the word hello to that same number, 626-602-1165, so that we can stay connected and send you more information whenever we have something that we believe may benefit you. And then we want our Pasadena Church family, of course, if you're a member of Pasadena Church and you haven't done so already, take a few moments now to text the word member to that same number, 626-602-1165, so that we can share information with you. I've done that a few times this week as different needs and things have come up in our community just to be able to get to our members real quick and say, this is an opportunity to serve. This is an opportunity to give away food. This is an opportunity to be at the park with the presence. So please do that today. Now, we also want to invite all of you to join us for prayer. We have a united prayer line every, mon every morning, Monday through Friday, from 6 a.m. to about 6.20, 6.30. You can call this number, 609-663-5949 at 6 a.m. Pacific, 9 a.m. Eastern. And when you dial in, you'll hear somebody praying. And after that intercessor prays, we open up the line so you can share a request or need that you may have. And we will pray for you on that line on the spot. And then we open up a time for people to share how the Lord has answered prayer. And we're getting a lot of answered prayer as well as we trust God every day. So please join us for the United Prayer Line. I always tell people that early in the morning, that prayer is better than a bowl of Wheaties. Hallelujah. There's a special event happening this evening at 7 p.m. Um, we want all of the, our Pasadena Church family to join us. Every month we've been doing this in all church. I call it a family resumion, amen. But it's an all church Zoom gathering at 7 p.m. Those of you who, who, who watch our 6 p.m. service, um, as soon as it's done, you can jump on the line. We have the information on the screen. And if you're part of Pasadena Church, you've probably got um, an email concerning the login information. Um, it's very simple. Just go to, to the Zoom page. Page, um, zoom.us and just type in the meeting ID that's on the screen as well as the password and then you'll be on with us and we're going to have a good time in the Lord um, tonight at 7 p.m. The screen, the screen door is open at 6.45 so hop on early so you can see other everybody else and we can talk a little bit and just have fun with each other and fellowship and then at 7 we'll start our, our official time together. Finally, we want to invite you to partner with us financially. Many people say, how can we give to Pasadena Church? You're doing a great work in the community. You're doing a great work. Um, we like to just be a part of that financially. Well, there's several ways to give. We, we first of all, we say to people, if you don't have it, if you're not working or, or um, it's difficult for you right now, just know that there's no expectation. We're praying for you. And as the Lord blesses you and brings you to a place where you can give, then you can remember us and, 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 and help support this. But for those of you who are able to, those of you who are members who are tithers and givers, you can always give online at our, um, um, on our website, PasadenaChurch.com. You also can give through all of the cash apps and the, Zoom, the Zelle apps, all of these contemporary ways that people give via social media. We have accounts for those. And then you can always just mail a gift in to Pasadena Church, 404 East Washington Boulevard, Pasadena, California, 91104. Amen. Just like we said, it's all God. Amen. Whenever someone gives, we say it's all good. So thank you so much for just being a part of what God is doing here. You can continue to follow us on Facebook. You can follow us on YouTube. We're there on both of those platforms. Amen. 
And we're continuing to do the work. We're so encouraged about what God is doing in the midst of all of these things around us. The church is alive and well. Now I want to take you back a little bit to a little bit more of that song, Giving Me Life. We're just going to going to just worship a little bit longer. But just know that we love you. We're praying for you and you matter to God. God bless you. Hallelujah. Come on. If you've got that life, clap your hands. Tell somebody next to you, I've got the best life now. Come on, tell the other person, I'm living the blessed life now. I've got the best life now. Let me hear you, come on. Living the blessed life now. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Gee, I want to hear you sing it, Pastor Lee. Come on, I've got the best life. Oh. One more time, one more time. I've got the best life. Living the blessed life. Oh, oh, got the Oh, Jesus. One more time. Come on, clap your hands. 